Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Webs. Welcome to all of you who are here in person and all of you who are watching us on a screen somewhere. Let me just remind you that we will not have Webs one week from tonight because it's spring break. And uh, I do know some people are traveling some this spring break. And we just, the kids are just hoping that this year's spring break is not as long as last year's spring break. <laughs> Ended up being six months long. Okay, so glad you're here. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful that we can be here tonight, and we are uh, thankful for the times that we're able to open your word and let it speak to us, and whether that's just privately or in our family or with our small group or in any setting, Lord, there is this great power when we connect with you and your word. So tonight, I pray that you'll teach us what you want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're on Miracle 35, and basically, if you're wondering, there are 39 distinct miracles of Jesus that are recorded in the four Gospels, so we're almost getting to the end of that. Of course, we know Jesus did many, many more miracles that aren't recorded uh, in the Bible. In fact, John says, if suppose if every one of them were written down, all the books of the world couldn't contain them. Uh, But we're not finished with miracles because, uh, believe it or not, in the book of Acts, I'm sure you believe it because you've read it. In the book of Acts, there's about 20 miracles there. So we're going to continue on with all the miracles of the Bible, as we said when we started. Well, here we are, Mark 11. And we started this last week and and just really barely got it started. And and there's a lot of great truth in here. So let's start over again on this miracle of fig, faith, and forgiveness. The setting is... um, After the Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, uh, it's on Monday, verse 12, the next day when they were out from Bethany, he was hungry, that's Jesus. Seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it's not the season for figs. And I explained to you that the fig trees in Israel They really bear two sets of figs. They have sort of a small, uh, hard fig that comes out with the leaves. It should be there. And then later when the leaves fall off, there are larger, softer figs. So uh, that's a little bit misleading. Verse 14, he said to it, the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. He's just making an observation. And his disciples heard it. Now we're going to skip down to verse 20 because now... It's the next day. Early in the morning, which is Tuesday, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots uh, from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Hey, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And I reminded you last week that Jesus never used the word curse. He didn't say, I curse you, fig tree. He just said, you know what? Nobody's going to eat fruit from you again. Jesus replied to them, and here's this great four-word theme to live by, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, that's that verily, verily, amen, amen. If anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen, it will be done for him. So you you got one miracle in the drying up of a fig tree. You really have another miracle in throwing a mountain into the ocean, okay? Verse 24, therefore I tell you, everything you pray for and you ask for, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your wrongdoing. Now, All of that has to be taken as a section because you remember I told you when you look at verse 24, therefore, it's always connected to what's above it. That's when we're going to look at all of this. And so what we said, there's several lessons there. And I I started last week by saying the first lesson we learned from a tree, and it is a a lesson about fruitfulness. And this is where I left off last week. There are two applications for this. One is that there is an application for Israel. There is a 
national application of what Jesus was demonstrating by a fruit tree, a fig tree drying up uh, from the roots up. That's kind of important. Now, you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, all throughout the Bible, Israel is pictured as a fig tree. In fact, both Jeremiah and Amos, they compare Israel to a fig tree. Now, it's often also compared to an, an olive tree, but it is compared to a fig tree. And Jesus was basically saying, this, this tree that you see before you, it's a picture of the nation of Israel. They seem to be pretty fruitful right now, but you know what? They're rotten at the core, and the time is coming soon when they're going to be cut off from the roots up. So if you want to just write this down to study it later, uh, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard in which the owner of the vineyard puts farmers there to keep it. And so later he sends his servants and he says, okay, we want the, the fruit from the vineyard. And the farmer said, no, we're going to keep it for ourselves. And so they kill the farmer that they sent and the servants of the owner. And then the owner said, wow, that's, that's not a nice thing to do. So I, I know what I'll do. I'll send my only son. And of course, they will accept him. So the son goes to these farmers, sharecroppers, we'd call them. And they say, hey, give us the fruit that the master demands. And you know what the farmers say? If they even get together, this is in the parable, they say, you know what? Hey, if we kill the son, we get the whole vineyard. And so they killed the son and took his body outside the vineyard. Which I mean, there's so many applications here of Jesus coming to Israel after God had sent prophets and servants and they killed the prophets. He sent his son and then what did they do to his son? They they killed him outside the city. And then in the parable, Jesus asked the question to the listeners who are all these religious leaders. He says, now, yeah, just tell me, what do you think the owner of the vineyard is going to do to those farmers? And they answered the question. They said, well, he's going to take the farm away and he's going to punish the farmers. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 21, 43, right after he gives the parable, he says, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Israelites, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. So we know exactly what happened in 70 AD. The Roman army came in and literally cut Israel off at the ground. I mean, just destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. I mean, for, for centuries, there was not even a city named Jerusalem. It was Anelius Capolis, a, a Roman city. Gentiles lived there for, for centuries and centuries and centuries. I mean, the Romans were so angry after they leveled the city that they sowed the soil with salt so that it would not even be fertile. But, you know, both Jeremiah... And Amos, when they talk about the fig tree being cut off, they both mention that the root is still in the ground. And you folks know anything about trees? If you cut it off and the root's still there, guess what? Sometime it grows back. And then, when Jesus is talking about the end of time, and this is Matthew 24... 32, in case you want to access it quickly or turn to it. Pe the disciples are there and they ask him, Lord, when shall these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming? And he gives lots of clues. And here's one of the main clues he gives. He says, this is Matthew 24, 32. Now learn this lesson from a fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. 
Now, Israel, being a fig tree that was cut off for generations in some of your lifetimes and almost in my lifetime, the fig tree put back forth its leaves again. Because most of you, whether you were alive or not, you know what happened in 1948. In fact, it was May 15, 1948, when Israel declared themselves to be a sovereign nation and one of the first nations to recognize them as a sovereign nation was Harry Truman, United States of America. And because America stepped up and recognized them, quite a few other nations around the world did. Many didn't. And that led to the War of Independence where the Jewish people had to fight the Arabs that were there. But this was the beginning of Israel. And the, the fig tree has put forth leaves. And all you have to do is go to Israel today and, and see that the, the nation is healthy and, and strong. And so we have lived at least in a period of time when this prophecy of the fig tree has been fulfilled. And to me, this is the best sign because I'm not into all the, you know, prophecy junkies and all the weird little signs, you know, the third uh, horn on the fifth hoof or anything like that. But folks, you can't ignore Israel exists. And all throughout the New Testament, you read Israel, 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 Israel. So let's talk about great preachers of the past like Charles Spurgeon, George Truitt at First Baptist Church, Dallas. Every time they read the word Israel in the New Testament, you know what they had to say? They had to say, well, there is no Israel. Israel does not exist. And so uh, that's just talking about the uh, spiritual Israel, the church. And guess what? Today, when we read the word Israel in the New Testament, there is an Israel in existence. So as I said last Sunday, you know, John says we're in the last hour. Okay, I think we're probably in the last few minutes of the last hour. So I said that there was a national application of, of this. There is also, of course, a personal application about fruit. And we all know what it is. The problem with this fruit tree, it was guilty of false advertising. Because there were leaves and because there should, been, should have been those small little figs on the end for Jesus to eat, it was a living lie. And Jesus said, so nobody will eat fruit from you again. And the New Testament has a whole lot to say about fruitfulness because spiritual fruit is when we reflect the character of Jesus Christ. So you can remember a few years ago when I was preaching through Galatians uh, for about 10 Sundays, we sang... For the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the best way for me to remember them today by singing it. But. So they're not nine fruits of the Spirit. It is the fruit singular of the Spirit, and it's like nine flavors or nine expressions of the fruit of the Spirit. And the key to fruitfulness, according to John chapter 15 is to stay connected to Jesus because as it says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, remains. Wow, if you were hearing me Sunday, I talked a lot about that, didn't I? Just remaining in Christ. Remain, remain, remain in Christ. Jesus said, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me just remind you that we do not produce fruit. We only bear fruit. In other words, in my own strength and your own strength, you cannot be loving. I cannot be loving. I cannot be joyful, peaceful, patient. In my own, I can't do that. Any more than I could take a branch off of a fruit vine and throw it down on this carpet and say, okay, branch, produce fruit. The branch says, it's not my job. The vine does that. My only job is stay connected 
to the vine. I like how my late friend in heaven, Ron Dunn, used to say, he said, you know what we are? We're just a fruit rack. That's what we are, just a fruit rack where Jesus can display his personality in us. Okay, well, that's the lesson about a tree. Now, let's, let's learn a, another lesson about a mountain. I said this is the miracle of figs, faith, and this is a lesson about faith. And Jesus talked about, of all things, which seems to be an oxymoron, a movable mountain. So here they are, Tuesday morning. They walk up to the tree, and Peter, you know, he's, he's Dr. Obvious, uh, he said, Lord, that, that tree that you cursed, uh, look at it. It's, uh, it's dried up. And Jesus didn't say, yeah, I see that, Peter. No, what he said was, have faith in God. And if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, get up and jump into the ocean, and it'll happen. In fact, anything you ask by faith... Pray, it it will be done. So several things about this I want you to notice. Jesus didn't say, if you have enough faith, you can say to any mountain, be moved. He said this mountain. And so we know exactly what mountain Jesus was on. It was the Mount of Olives, because that's the mountain that's between Bethany and Jerusalem. I've walked over it and down it dozens of times. So Jesus is saying, if you have enough faith, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will be moved. So did you know there's actually a prophetic fulfillment of that? Did you know one day in the future, Jesus is going to move that Mount of Olives? All right, if you want to write it down and trace it later. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Then the Lord will go out in a fight against those nations. That's the final battle. As he fights in the day of battle, on that day, his feet, Jesus, will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will move. (laughs) It'll be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. I guarantee that mountain's going to move when Jesus says to. By the way, on the very top of the Mount of Olives, there used to be a, I think it was a Holiday Inn. It's deserted now because seismologists determined that there was a fault in the Mount of Olives and it, it, it could split apart. So they, it's deserted now. Yeah, all they had to do was read Zechariah 14, right? And they probably would have saved a lot of geologist fees. So... You know, there's also, though, a spiritual lesson here about, about moving mountains. So let's think about a mountain for a moment. Let's think about transportation through the years. Now, we live in an age of, you know, jet travel, air travel, but that's only been around, you know, for a little more than 100 years. Until air travel, all transportation was ground-based or water-based, And so whether you were building a road or building a railroad and you came to a mountain, it represented an obstacle. And you either had to go through the mountain, go over the mountain, or go around the mountain. But it it stopped your progress and you had to deal with the mountain. And so I think there's a spiritual lesson here that sometimes in life, as we're progressing in the Christian life, we come up against some kind of obstacle. And the devil puts this obstacle in our way, and he says, you're not going to go any further until you deal with me. And so I really think there is a great spiritual principle, and you know what we call it? We call it mountain moving faith. You ever heard of that mountain moving faith? And uh, I have a whole message on how to move mountains, and don't worry, I'm not going to give you the full meal, okay? I'm just going to give you the little the overview here. But if you have any things in your life that are keeping you from growing, problems, issues, weaknesses, Jesus said you speak to the mountain, not about it. I say that because a lot of times when somebody has a problem, all they want to do is talk about it. 
They just want to talk about how bad it is, how they're suffering, how they're hurting, how this problem is just making them miserable. Jesus didn't say talk about it. He said talk to it. Speak to the mountain. You know, I love everybody. I really do. I've just found that some people are easy to love and some are easier to love. But there are some people that you know when you ask them, how are you doing? They're going to tell you. I mean, they're not going to just say fine, which a lot of the time is a lie anyway, but it's polite at least. How are you doing? And they're going to give you a list of ailments and surgeries and procedures and things like that. And, and, you know, I think there's a great principle here about speaking to your weaknesses and speaking. It's like speaking to your demons instead of speaking about them. Let me give you the message paraphrase of what Jesus said here. If you embrace this kingdom life and don't doubt God, you'll not only do minor feats like I did to the fig tree. This is a paraphrase. But also you will triumph over huge obstacles. This mountain, for instance... You'll tell, go jump in the lake, and it will jump. You know, I've known people in the past that, you know, they struggled with addictions, and they just got to a point in their life when they just said, you know what, smoking, I'm tired of you, get out of my life. And they just said, drug addiction, I'm tired of you, get out of my life. And that's not all it takes sometimes. They need help, but they have to just speak to it like a mountain that's keeping them from growing. Another thing to do is you focus on God's power, not the size of the mountain. Because you may be saying, well, pastor, you don't know how my problem, how bad my problems are. No, I don't, but God does. And his power is unlimited. Can you all think of a Maybe a character in the Old Testament who faced a mountain of a man when he was just a teenager? Sure. And by the way, he didn't, he didn't talk about Goliath. He spoke to him. You know, and there's the little rap that Carmen did, said, well, little David must have just been in his teens when he faced Goliath of the Philistines, he was armed with just a slingshot and some stones. And Goliath was a giant as strong as a tank. And when he looked at men, their stomachs sank. And there stood little David all alone. But with faith in God, he flung that stone. And much to their surprise, he killed that monster with a stone that nailed him between the eyes. Then he decapitated his fallen foe to make sure that he was dead. And showed everyone there he was someone who really knew how to get ahead. Oh, really? I mean, David, David didn't stand back in the ranks with his brothers and just, boy, that's a big giant out there. Wow. And they, they didn't want to go out there because they said, you know, he's too big to fight. And David said, he's too big to miss. And this is exactly, he goes out there and he speaks to the mountain. And this is what he says. This is right out of the Bible. You come against me with a sword and a spear, but I got something better, big guy. I've kind of paraphrased it there. I have a name. And, in, and this hill isn't big enough for both of us. I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll knock you down. Then I'll cut off your ugly head from your fat body. And I'm doing this so everybody will know that there is a God in Israel. And the battle's not mine. It is the Lord's. Now mountain, get ready to move. And, you know, he wasn't worried about the size of the mountain. He was more concerned and trusting in the power of God. And then the last thing about this is that sometimes I've learned that God will move you instead of the mountain. Because sometimes the mountains... Are, are of our own making. We've created the mountains. Mountains of anger or bitterness or unforgiveness. And we speak to it and say, get out of the way, and maybe God wants to move us away. Now, there's a great example of that in Acts 16 when, when 
Paul was facing a great obstacle and he said, I, I need to go into Asia Minor and I want to evangelize these areas. And God said, no, you're not going there. He, he, he moved Paul and said, instead, I want you to go across the sea to Greece, to Europe. And so Paul said, okay. And God moved him. And by the way, any of us who may be of European descent, we should be mighty glad that God moved Paul to take the gospel to the Europeans because that really began the church in all of Europe. So sometimes, you know, people, mountains, they may be people, just difficult people. And I do have a good story about that that I'll finish with. Uh, in uh, probably in the mid-90s, as you know, our church was doing a lot of work after communism fell and the Iron Curtain fell. We were doing a lot of work over in the Crimea around the city of Yalta. And we took groups over there. We took medicine over there. On one particular trip, we probably had about 30 Green Acres members, and we were taking an entire sound system for one of the churches. It wasn't huge, but it was a portable sound system. We were taking medicine, and we were even taking some medical equipment that one of the hospitals had donated. So it was quite a bit of people, quite a bit of uh, luggage and cargo. And going over on the international airlines to Moscow was not a problem. It It was not outside the weight limit or anything. But when we got to the domestic airport in Moscow, uh, we all boarded the plane except me and loaded everything. And then one of the guards motioned to me to come over there. And our our translator was Olga, Olga Novakova, uh, who's still a good friend. Uh, We went back to this office and there was this very large Russian lady there in uniform. And uh, she says, uh, she says, through the translator said, "You, you and your group cannot fly to Sevastopol without paying for the extra baggage and cargo. And so I said, how much is it? She said, $1,000 American. And we knew that that bribery and corruption was rife there. And we had some money to give to the Russian Christians over there. But just something hit me at that moment. And I said, no, you can't have that money because that's God's money. And I remember Olga saying, you want me to translate that to her? I said, yeah, tell her exactly what I said. I said, you can't have that money. It's God's money. And she kept coming back. You know, you must pay or the plane's not going to take off. Now, this is everybody else's on the Aeroflot plane loaded up. I'm the only one that's not. And we must have gone back for 20 minutes. And finally, I just pointed at her. And I said, that's God's money. And you can't stand in the way of us going to this part of the world where God has sent us. And so she gets on the phone. She talks in Russian slams the phone down and I say Olga what did she say she said well she's going to let you get on the plane and go but she called her counterpart down in Sevastopol where the airport was and they're going to expect you to pay two thousand dollars or they're going to confiscate all the equipment all the luggage of your group so I get on the airplane and everybody in our group's clapping so we take off and we pray the whole way but you always pray when you're on an air flight airline anyway and so we land. It's about, a, it's about a two and a half hour flight. We land. And here is the terminal over here. It's not a very big terminal, but there's a gate and a fence. So we're all going to have to go through there. And I can see in that office, you know, this man with the same kind of uniform waiting to get the money or our equipment. Well, I mean, I look back behind the plane. It's a chain link fence. And there are all of our Russian pastors uh, with vans and trucks and everything to, for our group and for the equipment and everything. And so I just, you know, we, there wasn't a jet bridge going into the terminal. It was just air stairs. So I go over there to the, to the fence and call, uh, I think, Pastor Benjamin over. And I said, we, uh, we, I said, we've got a problem. In Moscow, they tried to charge us $1,000, and now they want to charge us $2,000 for all our equipment, or, or they're going to confiscate it. And I'll just never forget what he said. He said, he said, net problema. Next thing I know, he kind of motions over one of the luggage handlers who was a member of one of the churches. And before we know it, this luggage handler has opened another gate behind the plane. They pull up to the plane. They load all of our equipment, all of our luggage, and all of our people on those buses and trucks and just drive out of the airport. And I just wave back and sing, Das Vidanya. So to me, that really was a mountain 
of resistance that tried to keep God's people from doing God's work. And I just wasn't going to let it happen. So I just said, you can't have that money because that is God's money. And sometimes you have to speak to the mountain. But speak to it. Don't speak about it. Don't look at the size of the mountain. Consider God's power. And then know that God may move you instead of the mountain. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the richness of your word and just the many, many applications that there are to it. We're so blessed, Lord, to study it, especially when we apply it to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for all these folks that are here, that are watching on television. Pray that you'll keep everybody healthy and safe and blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.